JetBlue is finally coming to Canada, announcing routes to link Vancouver with New York and Boston starting in 2022. So naturally, I had to go to Vancouver to film this video. It's not a move that made headlines, but it's still nice to see, especially after JetBlue in 2011 said that Vancouver's market wasn't large enough to support these kinds of routes. But as with everything on this channel, I had to ask why. Why do this at all? Why wait this long? And why Vancouver in the first place? We'll explore these questions in a bit more in this video. Believe it or not, there are reasons behind decisions like these. We think that there are three main drivers behind this move into Canada. First, the new Northeast alliance between American Airlines and JetBlue. Second, the upside of the Vancouver, New York route itself. And finally, JetBlue's successful track record of disrupting premium markets. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Andrew for helping me get this mic that I'm speaking with right now. It definitely made the production process easier and helping me film outside. And if you want to support the channel in a similar way, you can buy me a coffee. I'll put the link in the description. It helps a lot. I also see that there's been a lot of engagement in the comments in my previous videos. So I made a Facebook group. I'll link it in the description and you can head over there, join it, and we can continue the discussion and talk about anything else about Canadian aviation. You may not have heard of this partnership between JetBlue and American, but it's a key reason why JetBlue has the mandate to expand to destinations like Vancouver. We'll explore what the alliance is, how it came to be, and what that means for both airlines in terms of destinations. The Northeast Alliance, or NEA for short, is a partnership between JetBlue and American that involves coach air flights, reciprocal benefits, and seamless integration between the two carriers, whatever that means. In more concrete terms, both airlines are launching new routes and passengers have more destinations to choose from. One of these routes connects Vancouver and New York, the one that we're interested in. Now to understand that specific one, we have to look at how the Northeast Alliance overall came about. The simple answer is COVID, but I think you're here for a better explanation. In order to get a complete picture of the motivations behind the NEA, a bit of background on both carriers is necessary. First up, JetBlue. They started out as New York's hometown airline but they've grown to serve most of North and South America from the Northeast US. They're dominant at JFK and Boston Logan International Airport, holding down 37 and 33% of the market share respectively at these two airports. They're also headquartered in Long Island and have Terminal 5 and JFK as their personal playground, so they're definitely dominant in the area. JetBlue expanded to the West Coast in the mid 2010s and recently launched a transatlantic route to the UK, but they remain heavily focused on the continent. To get the American perspective of things, I'm in San Francisco with my friend Greg, who is a certified plane man, and I'm going to ask him a few questions. So, can you tell us a bit more about the significance of JFK and New York to American Airlines? Yeah, so JFK has always been an important hub for American Airlines before the merger with US Airways. A lot of the routes were inherited from the TWA days. I think during the merger in 2013, what happened was Philadelphia and Charlotte were the major hubs for US Airways and American decided that it would shift a lot of its routes from JFK to Philadelphia, for example, Zurich, Manchester. And what they kept behind was a very skeleton network of routes that were basically business routes, for example, to Paris, to London, um, to Milan. Now, Philadelphia continues to be the primary transatlantic hub, especially as they try to recover from COVID and adding more leisure focused routes. Damn, very comprehensive history. With that in mind, how American emptied out JFK, we know that JetBlue has a very comprehensive domestic network. Why would American be interested in something like the Northeast Alliance or JetBlue? So at JFK, American is the smallest of Delta, JetBlue, and American. JetBlue has 37% market share. Um, so they have a very strong domestic network that's able to provide connectivity in and through New York. Uh, JFK is slot constrained, so there is a ceiling for growth for any one airline. For American, what they've decided to do was keep the high profitability routes. So business routes to London and Paris, but also all of the transcontinental flights to San Francisco and Los Angeles. But when there are other destinations 
that they want to serve, such as Athens, there may or may not be sufficient demand among New Yorkers for O and D traffic. So that's when the Northeast Alliance comes in, and JetBlue is able to provide the additional connectivity for feeder flights from other parts of the U.S. that Americans simply can't serve just because of the slot constraints. Makes a lot of sense. What's the outcome? What does the future look like for both airlines under this alliance? Uh, we're already seeing a lot of potential announcements. For example, Vancouver next year, but Americans also announced the number of routes outside of the U.S. For example, to Delhi, which has already started. At the end of the day, right, it's a win-win for both carriers because each airline can focus on what they're good at in JFK. So Americans can be good at the transatlantic destinations, and then JetBlue can be good at just feeding people to American with this domestic network without really doing too much incremental effort on their end. And now American can also start routes and new services to destinations that wouldn't be sufficiently met in terms of demand by just New Yorkers. So JetBlue helps top those off and make those flights at least break even. The Northeast Alliance is supposed to be a win-win for both carriers, allowing each to focus on what they do best. It also means that all of JetBlue's new routes in and out of New York aren't just about the routes themselves, but how they work in relation to America's transatlantic network. With that in mind, JetBlue has launched seven new routes as part of the NEA. And as expected, these all reinforce their existing strongholds in New York or Boston. But why specifically Vancouver? To answer that, we'll explore the specific route between Vancouver and the Northeast US. There has to be some upside to this route, otherwise there's no point in doing it. But how much exactly? To find that out, we'll first look at what currently exists between the two cities. How'd you get from Vancouver to New York? Well, it's not as easy as you might think. Vancouver's only about two hours from Seattle, but Seattle has far better domestic connections. Vancouver is a well-connected airport, but only internationally. If you're looking to get from Vancouver to New York, you're gonna have to maybe stop in either Toronto or Seattle. There just isn't much going on. In 2019, pre-COVID, only four airlines linked Vancouver with New York. Cathay and Delta to JFK, United and Air Canada to New York which is a slightly different catchment area. Delta and United also only flew that route during the summer. So year round, it's more like two airlines. If the presence of Cathay Pacific confuses you, you're probably not alone. It's an airline from Hong Kong pulling off a fifth freedom flight in another continent. I could completely skip this for the purposes of this video, but I'm not gonna give them an excuse to talk about Cathay, the best airline in the world. Cathay has linked Hong Kong with every major financial hub since the beginning of time. It's also known as 1983. This involves New York, but back then, Cathay didn't have the planes that could make the direct 16 hour flight. The solution was a 747-200 from Hong Kong to Vancouver and then on to New York. What was supposed to be a stopgap ended up building a cult following. In 2004, Cathay launched a direct flight from Hong Kong to New York with a 747-400. But by that time, the Vancouver to JFK route had already established itself as a rare opportunity to experience Cathay hospitality without actually flying to Hong Kong. It was also the only way to get the full first class experience between these two cities. This all happened until 2019 because it turns out that the route wasn't actually profitable. So Cathay pulled the plug. This leaves Air Canada as the only operator between Vancouver and New York year round. And that route has been suspended due to COVID. It remains to be seen when it'll come back, but it leaves opportunity for JetBlue to step in. That's the current state of supply between the two cities. But how about demand for flights between Vancouver and New York? We unfortunately don't have access to precise passenger numbers, but around 3 million people live within half an hour of the airport. And a two hour catchment window includes Whistler and Victoria, which you can actually take a seaplane to from here. In terms of the type of travel, three quarters of visitors from the US are actually here on leisure, with only 12% here on business. The tourism contributions are well known by now. Some estimates peg that before COVID, tourism as a whole in the city of Vancouver helped drive an incredible and probably inflated 10% of the city's GDP. It truly is a beautiful place to visit, with hikes like Grouse Grind and easy access to ski resorts like Cypress Mountain. If nature isn't your thing, or if it's raining, as it is 80% of the time here, there's an infinite amount of food that you can have instead. Cruises are also extremely popular, bringing over a million passengers in 2019 to Vancouver. These aren't just routes that originate and end in the city, but ones between Seattle and Alaska as well. That's pretty much the current state of the route between Vancouver and New York. The bulk of it is leisure travel, and there isn't much direct connection. There already seems like potential for JetBlue here, so let's dive into the upside of them launching a new route. Note that we're looking at the upside of the route itself, not specifically relating to JetBlue. The obvious upside here is to take advantage of Vancouver's vibrant tourism economy, and also make use of the fact that only Air Canada offers a viable year-round alternative. 
It's not a stretch to imagine there being a supply gap between the two cities as demand recovers from the pandemic. In addition to Cathay Pacific retreating from the two cities in 2020, Philippine Airlines also pulled their Vancouver New York flights after receiving A350s in 2018, allowing direct service from Manila by obviating the need for a technical stop in Vancouver. Load factors for the Cathay and Philippine trips did regularly run light, but these were on wide body 777s, and in Cathay's case, a daily occurrence. There will likely be some latent demand that JetBlue can capture, especially if they run smaller A321s with around 150 seats a few times a week. In some ways, the inherent attraction of Vancouver as a leisure destination might be enough, meaning all that a carrier has to do is provide seats and those living around the New York area will fly. It's simpler to break this down into the winter and summer seasons. In the winter, BC is great for skiing and New York isn't. There aren't many good slopes left in New York, so you have to drive at least 7 hours to get north of Boston, such as to Sunday River or Sugarloaf in western Maine. But nobody likes to drive 7 hours in the snow, especially if it's after work on a Friday and you're trying to go for a weekend trip. A 5 hour flight to Vancouver suddenly doesn't sound so bad anymore, and might actually be preferred to driving in the winter. And you get to go to Vancouver. Whistler and other BC destinations outrank east coast slopes on pretty much every ranking you'll find. And there is demand for this type of activity, at least anecdotally from the internet, and my friends. In the summer, Vancouver's cruise industry should be an intriguing opportunity for JetBlue. The Northwest cruise market, basically Alaska, is tiny compared to the Caribbean scene. But that's not for a lack of demand. Or maybe I should say, not for a lack of interest. Google search trends for Cruise Alaska in the state of New York show statistically significant growth of around three Google popularity points per year between 2011 and 2019. This analysis took me way longer than it should have, considering this is basically my major. Turning to more anecdotal evidence, it seems that the difficulty of getting to Seattle or Vancouver for a cruise is well understood by those on the East Coast. Here are some of my favorite excerpts from forums that explain the appeal of Vancouver and Alaska for cruises, as well as the difficulty in reaching them, all from the perspective of those living in New York. A direct connection between New York and Vancouver would place any airline in an extremely attractive position to capture this latent demand for cruise travel. The fact that JetBlue is already well connected with the cruise industry is an added synergy. Their existing activity in Florida means that the carrier has partnerships with cruise operator heavyweights like Royal Caribbean International, Celebrity Cruises, and Carnival Cruise Line, a trio responsible for an estimated 70% of the global cruise market. Not only do these relationships make it easier to build potential cruise partnerships in Vancouver, but it also means that JetBlue has existing cruise packages and travel products to offer to customers through JetBlue Vacations. They don't need to invest as much in building that expertise, lessening their costs, and creating a better experience for their passengers. We just covered the upside that JetBlue can capture by simply linking New York and Vancouver, but it's almost a study in what any half-decent airline could stand to gain by linking the two cities. And to be fair, that's what we set out to do. We examined the route in isolation, looking at very few JetBlue-specific ideas. The concepts of a supply gap and latent demand for ledger travel don't necessarily favor JetBlue over any other airline. I'm saying that even a zero-war airline could stand to gain from this, and that's a baseball reference, which you'd understand if you follow baseball. And if you don't follow baseball, why aren't you? Oh, got oh. it, got it, got it! Oh. oh my god! Holy shit! That being said, I think there's immense value to JetBlue specifically that the airline can capture. We'll explore that in the next section. We left off by wondering what benefits could accrue to JetBlue specifically. I feel that JetBlue is better positioned to create and capture more incremental value on this route than any other airline. When I say create and capture incremental value, I mean the additional revenue and traffic that JetBlue can drive compared to other airlines like Delta or United. There are therefore two things that I want to cover here. First is the JetBlue effect, and the second is the element of disruption built into their culture. This JetBlue effect describes how the airline typically drives down prices when they enter a market, largely thanks to their low-cost carrier routes. If this sounds like the Southwest effect, it almost is, but there's a twist. JetBlue seems to have figured out how to lower premium prices too. Virgin America CEO David Cush infamously said in 2015 that the presence of JetBlue on certain routes forced premium prices down by 50% across all carriers, something that the airline themselves acknowledged to have happened during their West Coast expansion in 2014. These claims might sound extreme, but even conservative estimates have credited the airline with driving price reductions of around 25%. The route between Vancouver and New York seems to fit this premium profile. Think about the key demand driving activities that we mentioned earlier. Skiing, winter sports, cruises. These aren't exactly cheap. I'll take a bit of time to explain how JetBlue drives down premium prices, mainly because I'm looking for an excuse to talk about Mint, their premium product. Mint spearheaded JetBlue's transition away from being a strictly low-cost carrier, offering an experience built around a fresh take on amenities and food. 
and the fact that their cabins were newly designed. This is ridiculous, <laughs> in a good way, and I'm convinced more than ever that there's no other airline in the US that can come even close to what JetBlue is doing these days. However, what initially separated Mint from the competition wasn't food or cabins, but the price. Part of the reason for this was the higher cost structure to legacy airlines, but also the concept of bid price. I'll use the example of Seattle to JFK to explain this concept. Airlines like Delta typically operate this segment as part of a longer flight onto Europe, meaning that the Seattle JFK segment is priced as part of an entire transatlantic flight. This allows the individual segment to be priced higher, as well as discourages passengers who are ending in JFK from taking premium seats away from higher value long haul passengers. But Mint wasn't just a cheaper premium product, it was arguably the best premium product out there regardless of price, forcing legacy carriers to drop prices in retaliation and upgrade their own products. So what does this mean for value to JetBlue? Well, this downward pressure on prices and subsequent stimulation of premium markets increases demand that the carrier can then capture for itself, something that the superiority of Mint helps with. There might not currently be a large market for the route between New York and Vancouver, but JetBlue has to be confident in their ability to grow it and reap the rewards. Finally, JetBlue has never shied away from an opportunity to uproot the status quo. Their very existence was intended to disrupt the complacency of legacy carriers by offering the best coach product in the US. Led by the near mythical David Nealman, Nealman? who managed to start WestJet during the five years of downtime from a Southwest non-compete clause, the carrier did things their own way from day one. They brought together amenities unheard of on low-cost carriers like satellite TV and leather seats, and focused intently on building an almost countercultural culture, leaning heavily into the idea of being the scrappy yet lovable underdog. It's the cultural side of the equation because if we lose that edge, we're going to start to look like everybody else. This spirit naturally became harder to maintain as JetBlue grew, but they never stopped innovating. From paperless cockpits to having all crew members clean cabins after flights, to being the launch customer for the E-190, they kept pushing the envelope. Their West Coast expansion in 2014 was aggressive, but their new transatlantic routes to London are even bolder. So where other airlines may see little upside in Vancouver, you bet that JetBlue thinks differently. Their head of revenue says that they can't wait to shake up the status quo in these markets. And I'm inclined to believe them. If anyone can do it, it's probably JetBlue. It's a little surprising that Vancouver and New York are currently connected by so few airlines. Both are major cities in their respective regions with healthy demand for leisure travel between them. JetBlue's decision to launch into Canada through Vancouver therefore isn't as surprising, especially when factoring in the Northeast Alliance with American Airlines and JetBlue's own track record at disrupting premium markets. That being said, this certainly is not a risk-free move. The volatility of leisure travel may make the Vancouver-New York pairing more suited to seasonal operations. Feeder traffic from Vancouver to New York might also not be that important to the Northeast Alliance, lessening the importance of the connection to the Alliance as a whole. Either way, I'm personally very excited that JetBlue and Mint are finally coming to Canada. It's a move that's long overdue, and if it works out, we could see more connections from the East Coast in the future, probably to Calgary next. Once again, for those passengers traveling on Air Canada flight, this involves New York, but back then.